this week on waterways, sanctuary no-take zones, and Florida Keys Bird Rehabilitation Centers. The Florida Keys have long been known to provide for a productive multi-species coral reef fishery and a billion dollar tourist economy. Contrary to popular perception, these ocean resources are finite and human activities can be devastating. Although it was once believed that fishing could not harm wild populations, the collapse of major fisheries show that most, if not all, marine resources are exhaustible. I will say this, our research suggests though that uh, you know, a lot of our species are being caught on a non-sustainable rate, that we need to do better protection and more protection to maintain the health of those stocks. Many fisheries around the world have been depleted or have collapsed entirely, such as the reef fisheries in Bermuda and Puerto Rico. For the first time in history, we have the ability to catch fish faster than they are produced. New technologies like GPS systems and echolocation devices have shifted the advantage of fishing to the fishermen. We now realize conservation is extremely important to our well-being. If we don't take care of the health of our marine ecosystems, we won't have jobs, we won't have an economy, we won't have recreation, employment, and all the things that we value here in the Florida Keys. To ensure that fish stocks like groupers and snappers do not collapse, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary has established marine reserve areas, sometimes called no-take zones, within the boundaries of the sanctuary. Uh, marine reserve is a special kind of marine protected area that's defined by not having any extraction going on. That means no fishing, no collecting, no harvesting or removing of any living marine organism. The concept is simple, that by uh, removing human interference, nature can take care of itself and the system can survive. It's been able to evolve and survive for millions of years without human interference, and, and by removing human disturbance, you know, it can continue to be healthy in the future. One of the first marine reserves in the United States was started in 1962 as an accidental byproduct of restrictions in boating set around Cape Canaveral Space Center. Biologists soon realized that depleted stocks off the eastern coast of Florida were being replenished and that the sizes of fish in surrounding areas were increasing. However, it wasn't for another 30 years that scientists implemented this conservation tool in other areas. Now the first purposely designed network is in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. In 1997, 23 areas were set aside as special zoned areas, or essentially no-take areas. Most of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is open to fishing. Marine reserves, places where nothing can be extracted, account for less than 6% of the sanctuary. You know, the idea of establishing no-take reserves is very controversial. Uh, a lot of people are using, used to fishing anywhere they wanted. A lot of people didn't understand the need or didn't think there was a need, so there was quite a bit of controversy. The principal forms of regulation that have existed in marine fishery conservation programs are quotas, size restrictions, and bag limits. While most fishermen accepted and understood the concept of these conservation efforts, they can be expensive to monitor and difficult to enforce. With marine reserves, enforcement is more effective because it is easier to determine if someone is fishing in a no-take zone than to determine if they are using legal methods or have a legal catch. Quotas and bag limits can also be ineffective due to fish mortalities after the fish is released. Fish often die when caught in deep water because of injuries associated with depth changes and even when handled properly, many die because of the way they were hooked. All those other tools demand that we know 
a lot about how the system interacts, what fish eat what fish, how fishermen behave, how many fish they take, do they obey the size limits, laws, things like that. If you don't know everything about a resource, you should set some aside and not use it. And it's a very common principle we've done on land for 125 years, and we're just now starting to do it in the ocean. One of the most important functions of reserves is to provide insurance against stock collapse. Normally, millions of eggs produced may result in only tens of survivors. Therefore, it is essential that some large, sexually mature adults, those most favored by fishermen, are protected. Fish are bigger in reserves, or more of them, they produce millions of more eggs. And these eggs are dispersed by ocean currents. Some will go a short distance and resupply a reserve. But most of them get carried off into the fishing grounds and other nursery habitats so fishermen can catch them. So they actually have potentially more fish they would than they would have if all areas were exploited under one set of regulations. Total egg production increases exponentially with body size. For example, one 61 centimeter red snapper can produce as many eggs as 212 smaller 42 centimeter females. This means that a few older and larger fish are disproportionately responsible for future stocks. Unfortunately, fisheries tend to selectively target and remove larger individuals because they provide more excitement, food, and revenue than smaller fish. So juveniles have high mortality, adults have low mortality. Once they're adult, they've kind of made it in the reef system, and uh, they live a long time. Fishing tends to change the game so that a lot of those uh, die prematurely. Scientists spent years sampling before establishing the reserve areas. Visual estimates of size, abundance, and distribution for multiple species were regularly and systematically collected by highly trained and experienced divers. Areas chosen for reserves were positioned to take advantage of oceanographic processes that favor larval dispersal and recruitment. The specific species that benefit from marine reserves are those that are non-migratory, like snappers, groupers, lobster, and some grunts. Once the larvae settle in an area, they tend to remain in that zone indefinitely. This leads to another benefit with marine reserves, spillover. When population density increases for a specific species in a marine reserve, many individuals will venture outside the reserve where there is more food, less competition, and because they don't know the reserve's boundaries. Fishermen have been quick to realize that large fish and lobsters are usually found right outside a marine reserve. We see fishermen you know, lining their boats up around these, these no-take zones. The idea of catching some of that spillover coming over, so they obviously seem to think it works. We see lobster traps concentrated around these no-take areas. Yet another benefit of a marine reserve is the preservation of genetic diversity within a species. Unlike animal husbandry, which protects animals with desirable characteristics, fishing operates by removing the individuals with the most desirable characteristics. This results in fish stocks with less desirable traits, smaller, slower developing, and genetically inferior fish. It also protects the genetic quality of these fish because this allows these areas where these fish are slow growing, get old, you know, live very long times, decades, um, uh, can be dumb, grow fast, all these things uh, can be selectively removed by fishing. So by having some of these areas protected, we can maintain the quality of the fish stocks, not just the quantity. One goal of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary is to provide a scientific basis for assessing the effectiveness of marine reserves for coastal ecosystem management. Since the establishment of marine reserves, Sanctuary staff has been closely monitoring the effects of these reserves. So the question is, are they working? Well, I should state that you know, the reserves are still early in the process. It's only been five years since these established. These fish live 30 or 40 years, so we expect changes to go on for 30 or 40 years at least. So uh, it's still very early. However, we've seen dramatic changes. And what we've done is look at how many legal sized fish there are in these sanctuary protected areas and compare them to areas that are still being fished. 
What we've seen is very dramatic increases in legal size fish. Yelltail snapper, for example, have increased 35 times over our baseline uh, in the reserves in five years. Uh, some of the grouper have increased 20 to 30 times their previous abundance. Gray snapper have increased 10 times their previous abundance. The only way to have an understanding of the impacts of human activities on natural systems is to have reference areas with minimum human impact. These protected areas can also demonstrate which changes are natural and which are caused by human activities. A fisherman that starts fishing in the 1980s has a quite different experience and expectation than someone who started in the 1950s. And that would be different than someone who started in the 1930s, is that as the resource declines, as people come in and adjust to it, they, they shift their baseline uh, based on their own experience. Politicians and the public have been unconcerned about the depletion of fish stocks because the fish are still showing up from somewhere. The decimation is out of sight, under the waves. And most people don't remember or don't know what used to be there. The baseline has shifted. I came to Florida as a kid, there were 5 million people in Florida, that's 1960. By the year 2000 we have 16 million people in Florida and they're all wanting to use those resources and we're just you know, reaching limits to what the ecosystem can, can support. So we just need to be very clever in maintaining the health of that system so we have jobs, employment, and fish, and operations, recreation, all the things that our economy depends on. Except in the Tortugas, marine reserves in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary are easily identified by large yellow buoys used as boundary markers. Boaters need to follow the number one rule of the oceans. Know where you are at all times, especially if you are fishing in the vicinity of a marine reserve. Human beings, tool users. We populated our planet with technologies to make our lives easier. Roads and automobiles. Nylon fishing line. Electrical and telephone lines. We have the ability to learn what is dangerous and what is not. Birds are not so lucky. They evolved in a world where two-ton objects didn't move at 60 miles per hour. A world where things that looked like food were food and were not attached to a hook or a line. The Florida Keys are the last stop on the Atlantic Flyway for many birds that spend the winter in the Caribbean and South and Central America. Twice each year in spring and fall, hundreds of thousands of birds follow the narrow chain of islands to destinations north and south. Sometimes they encounter trouble. Hundreds and hundreds of them come through the Keys because it's a natural flyway. Even the barn swallows, everything comes through here. They come down the Keys, they mass up in Marathon and Key West, and then they migrate further south to Cuba, the Caymans, and down to Mexico. They winter there, and a lot still stay in the Keys in winter. And then the migration turns and comes back. So we see a lot of the birds that come through. Unfortunately, when we see them, they're always injured. Thousands of birds are injured every year in the Florida Keys. And fortunately, there are four rescue and rehabilitation centers to mitigate the damage. In Tavernier, there's the Florida Keys Wild Bird Center. In Key West, there's Wildlife Rescue of the Florida Keys. In Big Pine, there's the Exotic and Wild Bird Rescue of the Florida Keys. And in Marathon, there's the Wild Bird Center. When we started, we got about 200 birds a year, and now we get about 700 birds a year. So I would have to say that people are much more aware that we're here and that there is a place to take injured birds for care. During our migration, we see a lot of dehydration and malnourishment in the younger birds making the first migration. But mostly, I'd say between 85 and 90 percent of what we get in is directly man-caused, whether it be fishing lures and fishing line that was dis just discarded into the water, uh, impact with cars and boats. Unfortunately, we do see some um, cruelty to animals also as a direct result of humans. 
fishing line, lures, and hooks are the cause of injury for 80% of the birds treated at the center. Birds like pelicans, gulls, and cormorants are as attracted to bait and lures as fish are. When they strike at the bait or lure, many get tangled in the almost invisible monofilament fishing line. Some are even hooked in the bill. If a hooked or tangled bird is to survive, it must be freed from the line. When you see a pelican and she's got line coming out of her bill or wrapped around her feet, what you want to do is reel that line in. Don't cut it. Reel her in with your fishing reel, bring her to the boat or bring her to the dock. Reach down and grab her by the bill. It won't hurt you and you can get a hold of her just like this. So you've reeled her in, you reeled her in, you grabbed a hold of her, and just reach down and pick her up. Have no fear. Even though the bird is struggling and flaps its wings, it only weighs about six pounds, and it's really quite harmless when handled properly. If the bird has deep cuts or if a pelican's pouch is ripped, call one of the four local bird rescue centers located throughout the Keys. Because if the monofilament stays on them, the worst thing that's going to happen is the monofilament's going to get caught in the mangroves, and then the bird is going to suffer an awful death, either through starvation or asphyxiation if she goes upside down. Each year, anglers leave behind miles of line that have snagged on mangroves or submerged objects. Thousands of yards of this fishing line ends up tangling itself around the bodies of unsuspecting birds. Conservationists are encouraging anglers to retrieve their cutter snapped line, and they are trying to make it easier for fishermen to pitch in. Now these recycling bins are being mounted throughout the Florida Keys. Uh, hopefully within the next year we'll have them mounted at every fishing bridge, every fishing pier. It's a place for you to safely dis discard your used monofilament line. The gentleman who's been distributing these throughout the Keys said that they have already collected up over 500,000 pounds of used monofilament, which was kept from being dumped into the wild. So look for these at all your boat ramps, fishing piers, bait shops. They'll be available all throughout the Keys. Dispose of your monofilament line properly. The number of birds brought into Florida Keys bird centers has increased steadily over the years. It may be that there are more anglers on the water and these anglers are leaving more fishing line. Or it may be the result of a more educated and conscientious public. A long time ago, the seabirds were considered adversaries. You know, they would mess things up for them. But now they, they use the birds to find the fish. And it's become really symbiotic with them. And the fishermen now bring the birds in. They'll bring them in, take the monofilament line off them and let them go. Even the uh, offshore guys will do that. Whereas before, they used to just cut the line and let them go, and that's the kiss of death. At the Wildlife Rescue of the Florida Keys, located in Key West, Janet regularly sees the impacts fishing has on local birds. This poor little guy was found hanging from an electrical line. Somebody had cast their line up and caught their hook and line on the line, and he went after the bait that was still on the hook. Uh, we expect a full recovery from him, though. He was a little skinny, so we're plumping him up. He's still feisty, as you can see. <laughs> and uh, we expect to be able to release him within the next couple weeks. He'll be moving outside within the next day or two. Roads and cars are the second leading cause of injury for birds in the Florida Keys. A lot of birds are brought to the Marathon Wild Bird Center because they get hit by cars alongside the road. This is one example here. This little guy, we call him Heine, got hit by a car because he was eating some food on the side of the road. US-1 follows the same path as most birds' migration route from the mainland to Key West. The Keys are narrow. Hungry birds are never far from the roadside. They can be easily lured onto the pavement. To protect birds along the roadside, drive under the speed limit. Keep an eye out for birds and don't toss food out of the car. All the birds at the Wildlife Rescue in Key West are considered wild, with one exception. 
chickens of Key West, they were introduced back, it started as early as the 1800s. They were brought in for poultry, eggs, and of course, cockfighting. Cockfighting is very prominent in the Cuban heritage. It's considered a sport of kings. Chickens kept in Key West have found their way into the wild. Fighting cocks that have passed their prime are turned out into the wild. Storms often set birds free from their coops and pens. The Key West climate is ideal for chickens gone wild. Our concern is that they are eating a food source meant for our wildlife, especially our migrating wildlife. We are the last stop for fresh water and food before these animals make their open ocean crossing headed south for the winter. And a few chickens is okay, but too many running around is going to cause a shortage of food for the wildlife that's meant to be here. To protect wildlife and the chickens, Wildlife Rescue started an adoption program. To advertise, they sent flyers across the state. The advertisement invited animal lovers to own a genuine Key West gypsy chicken. The response was overwhelming and came from all over the state, from all types of people. We have been approached by a soup company, by two different alligator farms, which we turned all of them down flat. We make sure that these birds go to uh, private homes, uh, just to be pets, free roaming chickens. Since the program was initiated, the center has placed over 1,800 chickens in adopted homes. Wildlife Rescue's adoption program has put a burden on the organization that other rescue operations do not have to bear. Caring for chickens is expensive. I don't know whoever came up with the saying, eats like a bird, but they never worked with birds before. Birds have to eat all day long. Some of them will eat their weight in food every single day. Because of their high metabolisms, they must be fed constantly. The bird rescue centers in the Keys are funded predominantly through donations. While grants have helped the cause, donations are the lifeblood of the centers. The center's directors also need more volunteers and not just to clean cages. Most of the injuries we see are caused by humans, so we are directly responsible to take care of these animals. Whether it be through donations or volunteering a little bit of your time every week to a center near you, you can help make a difference with our animals here in the Florida Keys. Birds thrill us with their songs, their plumage, and their behavior. They're one of the few kinds of wild animals that people can enjoy almost any day of the year. Keeping the skies, hammocks, and flats full of birds is a task we all can assist with. Without our care, we may lose these creatures that add a bit of color and charm to our world. <laughs>